President Trump is criticizing the federal judge who ruled to temporarily halt his travel ban. Uh, the president tweeting today, quote, the opinion of the so-called judge, which essentially takes law enforcement away from our country, is ridiculous and will be overturned. Now, it's not unusual for presidents to weigh in on court decisions. However, it's highly unusual for the commander in chief to publicly criticize the judge himself. With me to debate, CNN political commentator and opinion columnist for the New York Times, Charles Blow. Also joining us, James Carfano with the Heritage Foundation. He also worked on Donald Trump's presidential transition team, both on foreign policy and homeland security, right up until the inauguration. Thank you both for being here. Good to be with you. I, James, let me begin with you regarding that tweet. I mean, undermining the legitimacy of a sitting federal judge calling them so-called judge. It's not the first time. I mean, this is a president who, during the campaign, attacked Judge Curiel, who was overseeing the Trump University case. He said he couldn't make fair rulings because he was, quote, Mexican. That is not true. This judge was American, born in Indiana. What do you make of attacks like these and what they do to our judicial system as a whole? Well, I don't pay attention to them because I, I do policy, not politics. And Government, 99% of government is, is kind of like the iceberg. It's what's what's beneath the water, and it actually uh, what actually makes policy and implements policy. And, and the stuff that uh, that people talk about in tweets, I just I just don't pay attention to it because it, in you the end of the day, you don't pay attention to what the president of the United States yeah, tweets. Yeah, that's true. I didn't. Yeah, I, I I used to never listen to Obama's speeches either. And there's a reason for that. That's rhetoric, and I'm, and I'm I'm not dismissing rhetoric. I'm not saying it's not important. But if you're a policy analyst and you're looking at what the government actually does. What you do is you actually look at what the government actually does. So this is a president who says we are a nation of laws, right? This is about law and order. This is what this country is about. And yet you're undermining, is he not undermining the legal system that we have by questioning the ability of two federal judges to do their jobs? Well, that's your interpretation of the rhetoric. I look at what the government did. If the government ignored the, the judge's ban or if the government contravened the law, then I would say... We're not a nation of laws, but if you want to debate political rhetoric, then find somebody that likes to debate politics. Charles, you like to debate politics. Your take? <laughs> well, I mean, well, it, it, it says a lot about Trump himself and, and whether or not he sees uh, the judicial branch of the government as truly independent or whether or not he feels like he is able to attack whenever he does not get a favorable ruling. And that's really interesting because, you know, Trump is no stranger to the court system. He has been in the court system over his lifetime, thousands of times, either suing or being sued. He is intimate with judges, for better or for worse. And this idea, you know, this is a person who will, who is appointed one Supreme Court justice, may get more than that, who knows. There are 80 plus federal judges, judgeships open now. That's 10% of mm -hmm. all federal judges. If you have a person who looks at federal judges and says, if I don't like the way that you ruled and you are illegitimate, then that person, is, then you have to ask yourself, is that person the person you want filling the 80 plus federal judgeships out there? Because you do want those people to behave in a way that is independent of any other branch of government and to feel like that that is, that, that, that they are insulated from these sorts of attacks by the commander in chief. James, talking about the travel ban and the justification that the administration has used for it to keep this country more safe, uh, in the last 48 hours we saw that knife attack uh, at the Louvre in, 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 right. in, in, in Paris. And here's what the president tweeted about it. He said, a new radical Islamic terrorist has just attacked the Louvre Museum in Paris. Tourists were locked down. France on edge. Get smart U.S. But here's the issue. Um, when you look at the origin of the attacker. This was a resident of the UAE. He had a Saudi visa and he was an Egyptian national. None of those three countries are part of this travel ban. Does that undermine the president's argument in that tweet? What do you think he was saying in that tweet? Well, I'm, again, I'm not going to speak for the president. You could have to ask the president, but you know, I've worked on these issues for you know, over a decade and a half. What we've seen is, is if you show me one path of terrorist travel, that's mm. a path of terrorist travel. As a matter of fact, if you go back to the original 9-11 Commission report on terrorist travel, not the 9-11 report, but the, but the addendum, the, the one that looked at terrorist travel, what you see is terrorists tra have tried to travel every means possible. And you have to have a robust toolkit to deal with all those things. So to say 
this terrorist didn't use the method that you're defending against doesn't invalidate it, right? You want to you want to cover all. It's just he's tweeting about an attack and seemingly using it as justification for this ban when none of the countries. Yeah, but if you're not going to let me answer the question, we really can't have a dialogue here. So. The purpose of, of this executive order is to deal with an emergent threat, which is we had tens of thousands of foreign fighters flow into Iraq and Syria, which is different than the person you just mentioned. As ISIS reduces space, those people have to flow somewhere. Everybody believes that they're going to flow to six of the countries in the order and Iran, which is, a, which is a, known as a, the world's largest state sponsor of terrorism. So the executive order, whether you like it or not, is designed to deal with the outflow of foreign fighters, which, Bo, by the way, have used both the refugee pipeline and the visa pipeline to try to leave countries and do uh, terrorist attacks, principally we've seen in Europe. Charles Blow, uh, I'd like your response to that and also take a look at this. This is the cover of Der Spiegel, one of the most, if not the most influential publication in Germany, and this is how they're depicting this ban as the president cutting off the head of the Statue of Liberty. It is in inflammatory. It is meant to spark debate. I mean, what you think this does um, to the United States on the world stage? All right, so there, there are multiple levels here. One is the issue of whether or not uh, having a ban on these particular countries actually helps to increase the safety of America or actually makes America less safe by inflaming uh, tensions already in those areas by making it harder for those countries to cooperate. Some of them do cooperate with the United mm -hmm. States and help to fight alongside the United States uh, uh, soldiers and whether or not that will continue at the same rate that it is. There's also the international perception issue here and whether or not people can use this as a propaganda tool, whether in those countries or in other ones, to recruit people who may already have, you know, problems with the United States, whether they are justified or not, whatever, who cares, but, but recruit people into an ideology that radicalizes even more people. But then there's also, uh, for, uh, on, the, on, the, on the American side, mm -hmm. the economic, the, the raw economics of it. There are brilliant people in the world. We want more of those brilliant people working for us, adding to our uh, intellectual capital, adding to our economy, than rather, rather than staying in their countries and adding to the, the intellectual capital and the so, economies so of Charles, those countries. So, Charles, what do you, what do you make of the fact that, I mean, the CNN polling, I think we can pull it up, it shows a pretty fair, fairly even divide on how people feel about the travel ban. You've got 53% opposed to it, 47% favor it. Well, I mean, these, the, these kinds of polls, I mean, I, I separate out polling issues, mm -hmm. right? So there, this is just a very much more complicated issue, uh, and I, I'm always wanting to ask, what do you know about it before you ask, give you your opinion about it? Uh, you, you have to remember the vast majority of the country lives in places for uh, to uh, where immigrants do not flow to, particularly uh, immigrants from those particular kinds of countries. Those people generally come to the coast and to the border region, border states and a lot of places in the middle have no contact and so they don't see the benefit of it. They don't see, they don't have neighbors and co-workers who are part of that immigrant group and they don't, and it's very, it's a lot harder to empathize with those particular people if you just have no kind of contact with them. So it, it, but when I have see questions like that, I want to ask, what do you know about the issue? Do you live or work around around immigrants, do, is this affecting anybody that you know? I gotta leave it there, guys. James Carfano, nice to have you on. Charles Blow, thank, thank you, you as well. Uh, coming up, millions affected by the president's travel ban order, but coming up, you'll meet a young Iraqi boy separated from his parents as his life hangs in the balance.